I want to thank you for listening to the Negative to Positive, which is brought to you by our good neighbors at State Farm. If you know me, you know I'm all about the real deal with State Farm. You get the real deal. Great service and surprisingly great rates. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Ha <laughs> ha. It's that little Chico Pitbull, Mr. 305, better said Mr. Worldwide, and you already know, next to the sexy, sophisticated, powerful, extremely sharp Jennifer Valdez. Hello. And, uh, that's right. My <laughs> uncle, everybody knows him as the living legend. Woo! The, the one that opened a lot of doors for us folks down here in Miami, DJ Laz. What up, what up, what up? That's right. And this is a negative to positive. And let me tell you what I love about doing this podcast. We get a chance to speak to so many different people from different, I would say, walks of life. It doesn't just necessarily have to be in the music business or in entertainment. And the person that we got involved today is someone that I met, came over to the school, spoke to the kids. And when he told his story, I feel that all of us relate one way or another, but it's the ultimate negative to positive. So with that said, I'm going to take off the sunglasses <laughs> and I'm going to say it's a pleasure, it's an honor to welcome Bernie Marcus, the founder of Home Depot to the Negative to Positive podcast. Bernie, we appreciate you so much. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Well, you know what? Um, one thing about Pitfall, you forgot that I was in show business. Oh, you? Oh, okay. I was an MC when I was a young kid working as a waiter up in the Catskill Mountains, and I was I was doing all kinds of jokes and things like that on the stage. Nice. And I did hypnotism on the stage as well oh, when wow. I was about 20, 21 years old. Well, that's what happened. You hypnotized me when you came to Slam and you spoke to the kids. <laughs> <laughs> so you're still in the industry. Yeah, when you said MC, I was thinking you were going to start rapping for <laughs> That would have been epic. <laughs> That I didn't do. That I didn't do. I'll but I, I, I know that you have a very... Uh, not only unique, but powerful story on your parents and where they're from. And I know that they're Russian immigrants, but also as far as your times coming up in, in New Jersey and being a part of, I always say, extracurricular activities, which in turn, you know, built our character, let's say. And that's why I relate a lot to your story. I'd love for you to touch up on that and tell the public about basically your life. Well, you, you don't have enough time for me, but I'll give it to you <laughs> as I can. Yeah, as you said, my parents are Russian immigrants. We're poor as hell. Um, I don't know anybody as poor as we were then. Wow. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, people have cell phones. They have TV. We had nothing. I lived on a fourth floor walk up in a tenement in Newark, New Jersey. And the truth is, my parents didn't speak English. And uh, my father was a carpenter, barely made a living. And we had, uh, I had two brothers and a sister. And we didn't know life was bad. I lived in a great tenement, had lots of friends. We played uh, ball all day long. We had lots of fun. But the truth of the matter is, well, we, we were poor. And I, I got interested in early, early on in life um, when I would walk with my friends and we walk out of our neighborhood and five or six miles away, I saw people living in one family houses with porches and I said to myself, I want to have a house like that one day. And I don't know how I'm going to get it, but I'm going to get it. And I decided that I was going to start listening to people who were successful, people who were, uh, got out of my circumstances and uh, try to get there and, and try to be in a situation where we didn't have to be dependent on anybody. Uh, worrying about where the next meal was coming from was a big deal in my house. Yes, sir. And, uh, but the one thing we had, I had a mother and a father. Uh, there was a lot of love between all of us. My mother believed in education. And my mother was a, uh, a strict one about going to school, paying attention to school. And I went to public schools um, the same way I guess you did. Mm -hmm. But in those days, public schools were a hell of a lot better than they are today. <laughs> uh, and I, I love going to school and I love learning and uh, learning how to speak properly. And uh, uh, the, the important day for me uh, was the day that my mother decided that she and my father were going to finally be able to get, become citizens of the country. Wow. And my mother made a dictate to my father and said, from here on in, 
We don't speak Yiddish in the house anymore. We're speaking English. Uh -oh. English. And, and from that, and my father was pissed off. <laughs> and I'm not going to do it. And she said, then you don't eat. And, and we started speaking English. And my father started speaking English. And I think that was very, very important because uh, it allowed them now to communicate and understand what's happening in the world. Uh, and even when we heard radio, which was a big deal later on in our lives, my father finally began to understand it. And, and he began to speak to us in English. And uh, it made it easier for him as a carpenter to, to, uh, to, to communicate with other people. So that was a big deal. And um, so, so I, I started working, um, uh, Pippel, I don't know when you started working. I started working about, I was 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And from the day I was 12, I don't think I ever stopped working. Uh, I bought my own clothes because my brother's shoes didn't fit me. Uh, their clothes didn't fit me. I had big feet. <laughs> they had small feet. And you know what they say about people with big feet? You know what they say about people with big feet, Bernie? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what they say about people with big feet, they got big socks. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. But they, they had small feet, and I had to, listen, I couldn't put my big feet in those small shoes. So, <laughs> I actually started working by myself, and I, I love the idea of being away and being uh, able to earn my own money. I never have to ask. I never asked my mother and father for another cent after that. Exactly. I bought my own clothes after that, and I continued that way for a long time. And um, finally, when it came time, I mean, later on in life, I worked in a, as a drugstore and as, as a soda jerk. I worked in a pinball machine, a, a, a bowling alley, and put the pins up. I, I don't think there's a job in this world that I haven't done. <laughs> I cleaned toilets. I did everything. But I, the goal was always to make sure that, number one, I could take care of my mother and father mm -hmm. and be able to take care of myself. And um, that it happened. That's, that's how it came about. It's that little Chico Pit Boom, Mr. 305, but it said Mr. Worldwide. You already know what it is. Now, you want to feed your whole crew with KFC? Let's go. I can get that KFC bucket of chicken, and you know that's fire. It's a home-cooked meal. You don't even have to cook. <laughs> now, Babu, you know that you could get that mac and cheese, that mashed potato, gravy, those biscuits. Now, that's that's trouble right there. That is fire right there. Pero mi madre, que rico. You know, on negative to positive, we always talk about striving and achievement. And Colonel Sanders was which some people would just dismiss as, as just a cook. But don't ever dismiss anyone because you don't know what's inside of them. He, he believed in himself. He, he created a great product. He created a great brand. He never forgot where he came from. Man, this, this guy sounds like somebody I know. Oh, and by the way, he was a great philanthropist as well. Man, we got more in common than what I thought. <laughs> now let me take a bite of this Kentucky Fried Chicken right here. Mm. Well, let me tell you... Uh, I went from Mr. 305 to Mr. Worldwide. You guys went from, from uh, Yiddish to English, right? <laughs> Something like that. But I, I also remember the conversation that you were having with the kids when you came over to Slam, and you were speaking to them about your journey, about your struggles, about your sacrifices, and how you were also involved in, in, in gangs coming up and how much you learned what not to do from being involved in those situations in, in Newark, New Jersey. Yeah, well, I, 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 would get, I would get beaten up, I think, uh, almost every day in my life. Number one, I was a feisty kid. I was always skinny, uh, but I was very strong. Um, and and I, I came out of a neighborhood that was half black, half white. I uh, went to a black school, uh, Southside High School, uh, where the whites were the minority, actually. And, um, but every day was a fight. And uh, I used to get into this fight with this gang leader, uh, John, who would beat the hell out of me every day. <laughs> and I would come back the next day and I'd fight him again. And, and he was bigger than I was and he was older than I was. And finally, one day he said, you just wear me out. He said, I want you to join my gang. And I joined the gang. I was the only white person in his gang of black, black kids. And we used to go beat up the white kids. That's all I could tell you. <laughs> 
<laughs> but all my friends, all my friends, I protected. So they love me. Yeah. I, I had more friends than you could possibly believe. Yeah, it became, well, I mean, that's what life's about, right? You, every day you wake up and you have to fight. And yeah, you get beat down. And it's not about how you fall, but it's how you get back up. And he got to the point that you were fighting so much, he turned around and said, man, if I can't beat him, join him. Join him. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> and I did. I did join him. And I also learned that at one point, if you can communicate really well, you can keep that fist out of your nose. Yes, sir. Uh, you got to be able to talk yourself out of it. And it's not always the wisest thing. Um, I will tell you that I did come close to hurting people. And I learned early on, uh, I made a decision. I remember one time I had somebody that um, really got to me. And this, I was about, I would say, 16 or 17 years old. And I just beat the hell out of him. And I was banging his head in the ground. And he was starting to bleed from the back. And I, I looked down and I said, oh, my God, you're going to spend the rest of your life in jail. Yeah. And I just stopped. And that's the last time. I ever got to that kind of position. I never wanted to be in a position to hurt somebody so badly that I would end up in jail. And you got to be able to control your temper. And believe me, I had a terrible, I was, I was as tough as you possibly can be. I mean, you can knock me over now. I'm 91. <laughs> <laughs> that would be easy. And, but, but I could tell you those days, nobody knocked me over. And I had a lot of people um, that when I went to high school, Dirty Jew was, I heard that all the time. And before the, the, the dirty got out and the Jew, they were on the ground typically. <laughs> uh, but, but, but after a while, I learned that, you know, pretty soon that was going to work out in my life. And, uh, but it formed my character. I'm, a, I'm, I'm basically um, somebody who's outspoken. I'm not afraid. I'm, I don't, I'm not politically correct. Uh, you know me. Yep. Uh, you know, I don't say the right thing at the right time. And I say what I believe. And uh, uh, this is a free country up until now. And uh, I just believe in that. I, I agree. Freedom isn't free, but independence is everything. And I think that a lot of the way that you grew up, you know, we relate. But that's what gave, always gives us that fight in, in life. So, for example... You know, Jenny and Laz, he was telling the kids when he was here that he had a, a, a certain job, whether it was a corporate job. And you, you were saying that you got fired not because you weren't doing your job. You were doing your job so well that it became, I guess, intimidating to the corporate ladder. Ooh. And when you got fired from that, uh, that I, if I believe it was around 48 years old and you made a decision on, on opening basically Home Depot. And that's where the idea came from, which is I go back to the fight of growing up. And always one way or another looking adversity in the eyes and going, hey, whatever you got, bring it because you're not going to knock me down. I mean, even at 91, let me tell you, well, you're as sharp great. as an axe. He looks great. Yeah. He looks amazing. And I, and wow. I hope so. By, yeah. uh, by the way, who am I talking to? <laughs> <laughs> this is Laz over here. I'm that, just kidding. That, uh, you got to put Laz. Uh, huh? I'll tell you one other lesson that I, I wish I had told your, your kids. You know, in, in the years that I led up to the 48, I worked for a lot of companies and every company that I worked for and I worked for people I didn't like. I would say that two thirds of them I did not like, but that didn't mean anything. I always worked the best I could as hard as I could and always wanted to get better at what I do. In other words, I had nothing. Some people say, well, that boss is an asshole. I'm not going to work for him and I'm not going to, I'm not going to knock myself out. That's the wrong attitude. The attitude is you have to work on yourself, just like an athlete. Mm -hmm. You know, think about an athlete. Think about yourself. Even yourself, uh, when you're off season, you work out, uh, you sing, you do the things to keep you in shape. Um, when you're when you're working with somebody else, you don't take a vacation because your brain goes to sleep, uh, your 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 mind goes to sleep. Uh, your incentives go to sleep, and that doesn't work out for you. So I, I worry about people uh, always blaming somebody else. Like I couldn't make it because I worked for this guy who was really bad. That's that's a lot of crap. Uh, <laughs> it's not them. It's you. Yeah. If you're good, you work hard, 
eventually you will get to where you want to go. I agree. It's a, you know, in society right now, there's a lot of victims instead of victors. They're, yeah. they're looking at everything and just yeah. looking to give explanation and, and excuses. And we all know that excuses are like assholes. Everybody's got one, right? <laughs> and especially <laughs> opinions now, too, as well. And, and by the way, Bernie, why we also relate is because we're definitely not fucking politically correct. <laughs> I was born Cuban-American, so I was already born politically incorrect. <laughs> and I'm a big... Um, fighter for and believer in in freedom and i go back to why it's an honor to have you on here and, and giving your story so if you turn in 48 you got fired or let off or resigned however it worked out and then what led you to say man you know what i want to get into the business of of building or or even creating the idea of of home depot well i was i was always very successful wherever i went uh I, I ended up as a CEO of this company in California, and the guy I was that controlled the company, uh, the majority owner of the company, was a total freaking asshole. <laughs> I mean, I, mean I, I put him down as one of he's dead now, but he, he was one of the great Definitely. freaking assholes maybe in the history of the world. He was a nasty human being. Uh, he called himself Dr. Uh, uh, not that the, he, he basically, uh, being the merciless was his name. He had a sign over his door, Ming the merciless. And he had, I don't know how many people working for him, uh, 20,000 people. Wow. But he was a nasty human being mm. and he did things with people. I learned a lot from him. Oh, no. uh, everything he did, I did the opposite. Mm -hmm. That was my learning experience. And by the way, I have to tell you this. Through life, I never had a true sponsor, but I had a lot of sponsors. But people that I, I look for their best, their best instincts, the best things that they did. And I tried to stay away from the dumb, stupid things that I thought they did and try never to do it again. And I know one thing, the key was dealing with people well, being able to communicate with people, uh, understanding people, uh, liking the people that work for you, uh, wanting, I, you don't want to be, you don't want to be their best friend. It's not necessary, but they have to respect you. And they have to know that when you make a promise that you will deliver the promise. So the end of the story is that he fired me and I never knew I had that many friends afterwards. We have people that came forward for a very dear friend of mine, Ken Langone, who, uh, who was a New York banker who call, when I called him on the phone, I was, I was really, the first time I'd ever been fired in my life, I'd never been fired before. I said to Kenny, I just got fired from this job. And at this time, he said, stop. He said, you just been hitting the ass with a golden horseshoe. <laughs> he said, you remember the story? You told me about a store. You wouldn't tell me what it was. You wouldn't tell me what it consisted of. But you told me about a store that would knock out all these other stores. How about if if you you if you started? I say, hey, listen, I don't have the finances to start it. And he said, let me let me raise the money for you. And he did. He raised the money for us. And I enlisted Ken, uh, Arthur Blank to join me as a as a financial guy. And Home Depot opened two years later. In uh, on my 50th birthday. Wow. I remember working. I believe my Billy, my wife, brought me Chinese food at 12 o'clock at night. I was working in my underwear because we wouldn't put the air conditioning on. We didn't want to spend the money uh, on the energy. <laughs> and we, we basically opened uh, two stores and then two more stores in Georgia. And that was the beginning of the success. And it was the Cinderella story. And it's one of the great stories in retailing. Uh, I don't think that anyone has ever grown as quickly as we did over a shorter period of time than we did. Today, Home Depot has over 400,000 employees. Oh, wow. 400,000. 400,000. That's crazy. 2,700 stores uh, in Guam, Hawaii, Mexico, Canada. Um, <laughs> And it's one of the great companies in America. And I'm happy to say I'm not there anymore, but we're very fortunate to have the leadership that we have. They're great guys. They believe in our culture. 
in the culture is you take care of people. If you take care of each other and you take care of the customer, the business will grow. And that's our philosophy. Take care of the customer and take care of our people. People love to work at Home Depot. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many millionaires we've made. Um, I, I, I guess that probably, I don't know, 6,000, 10,000, 10, I have no idea. Um, and, and early on, I remember discussing with our board and I said, I have enough stock in this company and I don't want any options. Now you go to every major company in the United States today, they give options to the top officers, the president, the CEO. Um, I probably could be as wealthy as Warren Buffett today, but I'd rather see all these people that work for me get wealthy along with me. They wow. broke their asses. Yeah. They worked 80 hour weeks. They, they, they stayed with it. They believed in the culture. They believed in me. And, uh, I love them to death. I just love them. when I go into stores now. It's lucky I don't have a sexual harassment thing. As I, <laughs> I, I, you know, I walk in the store, they're gonna lock me up one day. They really will. Oh. I know it. This is negative to positive, and I know you're absorbing um, all of the. I would say the knowledge, the jewels, and the gems that we drop here, and what we're putting out there. Our mission is to educate and inform, and also make sure that. You know, you have a good time while we do it. I want to thank our good friends uh, at State Farm for helping me bring this to you, which is highly appreciated. You know, I've always been about making the right moves, and part of making the right moves is when it comes to insurance, you want to make sure it's the right move. This podcast is all about elevating ourselves and changing from negative to positive, and we're brought to you by State Farm. So keep in mind, when you're planning for your future, when it comes to insurance, they're going to get things right. <laughs> After the show's over, I want to urge you to spend a little time and check out State Farm. They're going to be there to protect you for all the things that matter the most. When we were looking for a partner for Negative Deposit, I came up with State Farm. I want to tell you why. Three reasons. Number one, you're going to get great service. Number two, guess what? You're going to get great service and surprisingly great rates. Tremenda sorpresa, which that's a great surprise for sure. <laughs> and number three, you're going to get the real deal. Because like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. You already know the deal. Darling. Oh. Bernie, I have two questions for you. My first question is... Um, you were stated earlier about the importance of, of finding yourself and putting in that self-work. And how did you take that fight of being young and being in all that gang-related and taking that step back to be like, all right, now I'm going to use this towards my success. So how did you convert that energy of anger and frustration to be able to lead you to all the success that you've gained today? I, I don't know. I think it <clears> – I, I wish I could say that I had a uh, philosophy – but I think that now looking back, backwards, which I never do, by the way, I'm a very forward looking person. I never look backwards. I don't quarterback myself ever, 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 ever. Whatever I did, I did. If I made a mistake, I learned from it, but I don't dwell on it. Now, in those days, whenever those things happened to me, um, it was a matter of surviving. Mm -hmm. In those years, it was surviving. And, uh, I had to figure out the best way to survive. Look, I watched other people. By the way, that gang I told you about, four people in that gang went to the chair oh. and were executed. Wow. I could have ended up like that. I chose not to. Uh, these guys were great guys, by the way. Uh, they saved my life. Can I tell, I'll tell you one story. I'm, Absolutely. I got a great story. <clears throat> when I moved... I moved to this nicer neighborhood, a middle class, wasn't nice. It was a step up from where I lived and in another neighborhood, but we had a gang called the Martini Gang that for some reason picked out, picked me out and would do exactly what happened to me. Now I'm a little older and they would end up beating the crap out of me, you know, on the streets. And they'd always have five to one. If it was one to one, even if it was three to one, I had a chance. If it was five to one, I didn't have a chance. You know, I always have a little guy that would punch me in the stomach and start the fight. And this went on for a long time. And one day they caught me on a block. And I, I recently, I was back in Newark and I took my, my associates to the street where they damn near killed me a popular street in Newark. They, they stomped on me, actually stomped 
with their hand with their uh, with their uh, shoes on my head um, and tried to do and they they hurt me pretty badly and I went back to my gang that my gang and I said they're gonna kill my ass and maybe you can help me. So we figured out a strategy and the strategy was this. I went back and I said, I want to meet the head of the gang, Martini. I was 15, he was 18. He was big, I was not that big and not that, I was not as strong as he was. And I said, I'm going to have a fight with you, one-on-one, -on -one, mano a mano, and whoever lives, fine, whoever doesn't, doesn't. And he accepted it. And I said, just the two of us, there's no question, just the two, nobody else around. And I told him where to go. I remember it was Jellif Avenue, on Jellif Avenue in Newark, right by the, uh, the railroads. And uh, I knew he showed up with the whole gang. And 20 some, of, 20 some of them came down and just me and him. And we started a fight and all of a sudden the doors open on, on the freight trains. And all my buddies came out with <laughs> wrenches and hammers and God knows baseball bats. And uh, 10 of them were on the ground. All I can tell you is that 10 of them were unconscious before we finished. I stopped them before they killed everybody. And they put this one guy up against the wall and they said, you ever touch him? If anything ever happens to him, we're coming to get you and your mother, your sister, your two brothers and your aunt, and your uncle and your grandmother. And that was the end of my fights in Newark. But that came back. It just goes to show you, sometimes loyalty really pays off. And I'm here <laughs> today probably because of it. Well, let me tell you that, that that's that. I go back to that fight. That's an actual story that actually happened to me. Yeah. And, and well, you know, now you're 91. You can have those kind of stories <laughs> without being incriminated. But I, look, if, if people only knew what it is to get... Uh, bullied in this day and age when they talk about those certain things. You know, when I hear about these kids and them getting bullied, I just tell them, I said, why don't you just turn off your phone or don't read those messages or delete? Um, you know, same way that you went through certain things. I used to get jumped as a kid as well. But I, I thank God for those, I would say, situations because it makes you tougher. It makes you resilient and it makes you willing to, to fight no matter what. And no matter if the odds are against you, you almost welcome those kind of situations at that point. You know? So to, to hear your story and to hear about what you did with how you took that negative to a positive and created Home Depot, funny enough, my name is Armando, and Armando in, Spa in, 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 in English, I'm sorry, Armando in Spanish means to build. So we're having this conversation for a reason. You built Home Depot, which built half of America, <laughs> and now the world, and, and my name is to build. And when you say about mistakes, which me, Jenny, and Laz have this conversation all the time, I say mistakes, you don't make mistakes, mistakes make you. Therefore, they're must-takes. And, and you took them and, and ran with them. And from that day that I heard your story in front of the kids, I saw the ones that really related to your story. And I could see it in their eyes. And what I would love to do is maybe by next time we, we have this conversation or by the time I see you again, because what I like about Bernie, Bernie will call you out. Yeah, yeah Bernie will call you out. So when I went to go see Bernie at his house and he had us over, which I appreciate the invitation, he told me, it's amazing what you're doing with the schools. It's amazing that you built something in your old neighborhood. But you know what? I want to see videos of these kids and where they're going and what they're doing and how much your schools really helped them. So it's not just about what he sees up front. He wants to see what's really going on. Not the splash, the ripple effect. Yeah, not just the sizzle reel. Well, so I, I, think, I think that what you're doing with uh, charter schools, and uh, let me tell you something. Again, I, I, I went to public schools, but the public schools were different than they are today. Um, the public schools today are not getting the education. The teachers, unfortunately, are more interested in, their, in them than they are the kids. We see that in Chicago. The teachers don't want to go back to school now. Uh, they don't want to teach in the school, and these kids are suffering terribly. Yes. But almost all the charter schools are back, and charter schools are teaching their kids. And and I'm we're very much involved. I'm a, well, part of my philanthropy is supporting charter schools, and we support charter schools uh, not only in Georgia uh, but in other parts of the country. And we 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 track them, and we track we track the success ratio of this kid. Listen, guys and girls, it's not always important to go to college. I, I'm going to make 
I'm going to make a statement that a lot of people don't know about. The, I could tell you this. I could tell you for a fact that some plumbers make more than some urologists today, believe it or not. Wow. They're both plumbers. A urologist, a doctor of urology, goes to school for 12, hour, 12 years. You give me a good plumber, he can make more money than a urologist. Uh, a great carpenter, a great electrician could end up making tons of money. We saw it at Home Depot. I mean, my customers, I love my customers. And I used to sit and talk to them and they would tell me they started out as a laborer and now they own their own crew and their own business and they're business people. And, but the key is they all know how to read, they know how to write and they understand math. And if you don't understand math, you're dead in the water. Yes, sir. You can't be successful. I agree. I agree 150% with that. And to be able to, so just so you know, this is a charter public school, so the kids that are here are 97% on, on free lunch, the kids that need it the most. And, and I agree with you as far as with education. Now, mind you, I didn't, I didn't graduate high school, but yet we're building schools, the irony behind that. But it's, it's about those general principles in life that you need to learn how to apply, which is the hustle. And how do you hustle is when you have struggle, when you go through sacrifice. And that comes with, bottom line, appreciation. And a lot of folks, if they only turned on that appreciation switch and looked at things and going, wow, it, it, this happened to me for a reason. How am I going to get out of this? What am I going to learn from it? And how are we going to move forward? It, it creates stories uh, such as yourself and what you've done with Home Depot. And that's why I feel that we needed to have this conversation. Because when we put it out to the youth, I mention this almost every episode, the youth actually thinks that instant gratification exists, that things just happen, you know, from from one day to the next. And we both know, and everybody that's sitting here in this room knows that anything that is for, for one worth living for, but if you're gonna create a business that's gonna help people and help those that need it the most, comes with a lot of hard work. And I tell people the harder I work, the harder we work, I would say the luckier we get. Now the biggest thing of, I think what we've accomplished and more than anything what you've accomplished, which motivates me and everybody around us is the fact of always giving back, like what you spoke about. I could be as wealthy as a, as a Warren Buffett, but no, to me what's more important was to spread the wealth, was to make sure that everybody around me got a chance to grow and feel the, the fruits of their labor, right? Now that I think is very important to speak about, Bernie, on how you invest into people, invest into what the future looks like, and it's not just it being about you, because we're living in, a, in, a, in times where it's very, vanity driven it's me 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 i i i not now right now and to speak to someone such as yourself and set that example would be great to just give you know a couple words to to especially the youth out there right now and what's going on i could tell you one thing number one i have now after 91 years being on this earth this is the greatest country in america amen and you have a lot of people that that are throwing around a lot of bullshit that this is a terrible place, that it's racist. Uh, I don't buy any of that crap. I think that if somebody is good, they can rise to the top. I think that it's one of the few countries where you can do it. You can't do it in other countries that the system doesn't allow it. The system fights you all the way. And I'm, I'm a proof of it for crying out loud. I was poor as I had, and look where I am today. I can have anything I want, but let me go back to the charity. The one thing that my mother taught us was that we give back to charity. That if we, it's Jewish tradition, it's tzedakah, it's a word. It means you give back what you get. And the more you give, the better life turns out for you. And I believe in that. Today, my fortune, 90% of my fortune, when I die, goes into my foundation. And my foundation is helping veterans we're very much concerned with veterans uh, who have post-traumatic stress. Uh, we're building hospitals all over the country, taking care of these young people that went out to fight for this country. I love these people. These people went, earned, you know, got nothing for it. They get paid nothing and they put their lives on the line and they come back damaged and nobody gives a crap about them. 
Uh, we're building hospitals all over the country to take care of them free of charge, and we know that the treatment is good. Uh, we take care of ch charter schools, as I told you, uh, all kids. Uh, we invest in medical. Um, I'm very big proponent, uh, about 40 years now, invested in autism. Uh, we built one of the largest autism centers in the world. Uh, uh, the Marcus Autism Center in Atlanta is known throughout the world of having treatments, and we are giving now treatments with clinical trials for drugs um, to help autistic kids uh, that may turn out to be good for other things. We're involved with a lot of drug research uh, on, and medical research. Uh, this is all, this all came out of all of the, the, the money I was able to make at a Home Depot. And God bless the people at Home Depot. They're doing great. Stock keeps going up. So we have more money to give away. And we are. We're building hospitals, uh, specialized hospitals. Uh, we have now three stroke hospitals for strokes uh, with the best stroke care maybe in the world. Uh, as well as vascular and cardiac. And so I could go on and on and tell you all the things that we're doing. And by the way, of all of them, one of the greatest things I have that we built was the Georgia Aquarium. And you, you've never been there. No, I haven't been there. You keep telling me about it, but we're definitely going to check it out next time this all opens up. You, you have to go there. It's, a, it's, a, it's unbelievable. There's nothing like it in the world, actually. It's about... 750,000 square feet, uh, over 10 million gallons of water. Uh, we have whale sharks 30 foot long yeah. uh, in this thing. And we have uh, sharks, regular sharks, uh, uh, dolphins. I mean, I can't, it's got every fish in the world. You want an experience, that's an experience. And uh, we built it for this, we built it for the state of Georgia to thank them for all the work that they helped us get who we are. We opened in Georgia, we love Georgia, and uh, we we just think that it's turned out to be, probably it's it's the best tourist place in Georgia right now. Well, I look forward to checking it out. And I wanna say, Bernie, thank you so much for the time. Thank you for the advice. And anything that you need on our end when it comes to helping the vets or helping anything that's going on with the hospitals, or in the schools, clearly, you know, you can always uh, count on me and count on us uh, as far as the team. But I want to say it's a remarkable story. It is true motivation and, and inspiring, especially for what's going on in these times. And I say thank you again. And every, just know that everything that you say, you know, I listen to and I try to apply to the best of my ability anytime that I'm around you because I know that it's, it's valuable, it's priceless. But I'd love to see you being a, a living legend and living out your legacy and, and knowing where you're going. And because life is all about moving forward, right? Everybody says you got to move forward, got to move forward. Like you were saying before, Bernie, where you say, you know, I don't look right. back, right? And we have a saying in Spanish, pa'lante, pa' arriba, no mires pa' atrás ni para impulso. That means you're moving forward, move up, don't look back, not even for a boost. But as much as life is about moving forward, ironically, it's what, a, it's what you leave behind. Yeah. You know, and you're leaving behind an amazing legacy and inspiring people such as myself and the team to be able to do the same. So we want to say thank you so much. We appreciate you. We appreciate your time. Look forward to getting with you in person and, and, and getting very politically incorrect together. Yes. <laughs> I'm down for that one. Put me down for that one, please. <laughs> We could end up going to jail again. You know? <laughs> That's all right. I got good bondsmen and bails, man. We don't really <laughs> and good attorneys. No, but really, really appreciate you, Bernie. If there's anything you'd like to say before we leave, yes. uh, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. Coming from a younger generation, it definitely means a lot to see what you came through, what, you, what you've gone through and what you've built. Um, my question, to, I want to ask one last question. You spoke about the importance of communication and leadership. What tips or advice do you have for people to become better communicators and better leaders to lead on a role like you have led? I have an old story. Let me show you the story. The jawbone. I say the jawbone, when the jawbone is open, when the mouth is open, the ears are closed. The, the bone goes up. So the key is shut your mouth and listen more <laughs> than you did before. Listen to what people have to say. They're not always right, but you know what? You learn so much from listening to other people. And communication is two-way. 
It's being able to speak, but it's being able to listen and listen carefully. Yeah, Amazing. I agree. Thank you. you know, it's funny you say that. The person that gave me an opportunity in the music business, his name, the first person, his name is Luther Campbell. And I used to just have all this energy when I was about 17, 18, just always in his face, like, what's the next opportunity? How can I do this? How can I do that? And he told me, you know, they called me Chico. He said, Chico, if you take the word listen and you scramble it, what is it? So I was thinking, I was thinking, and he said, silence, shut the f up, mother f and listen. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so believe I mean, me, I, I feel you, Bernie. That. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the same thing. By but the way, it's the same thing. thing. <laughs> Laz, any, any last yeah. words? No, not for nothing. Home Depot is so much cooler after this interview, <laughs> listening to you speak. Um, true inspiration. And I just love what you have built and the way your mind is set. You know what I'm saying? The, the legacy that you're going to leave behind for everybody. Truly, truly an honor to have you on From a Negative to a Positive because that is what it's all about right there. Yes, sir. So, Bernie, hey, God bless. Stay blessed. Appreciate you. Look forward to seeing you in person. And once again, we appreciate all the time, my friend, all the great stories and all the great advice. Thank you. Remember, America is the greatest place in the world. Woo Amen. Here's the crazy thing about Home Depot, right? So I used to I used to build efficiencies with my grandfather, with Abuelo Rudy, Rodolfo. And the thing is, is that even Home Depot being the store that it is, it created another economy outside of Home Depot. For sure. You got the Mexicans lined up, the Cubans were lined up, uh, down here in, in Miami, Nicaraguans. I mean, basically all of Central America and anybody, mostly Cubans, Dominicans, Mexicans and Central Americans that would sit outside of Home Depot. Ready to work. Ready to work. Like, they, they'll jump on any pickup truck. They'll jump on anything. And a lot of the guys that he was speaking about, that whether you're a, pro, a plumber or a neurologist, uh, I don't know if a plumber makes more than a gyne gynecologist, but... <laughs> Let's search. Depends on what neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but with that said, is I saw so many guys that were out there going, you know, hey, for the day I work for $50 or I work for $100. Some will work for a six-pack, to be honest with you. But... <laughs> But to see them and what they became, it was the platform that, that Bernie built. For sure. So you saw that even through his company, through the employees, through the team, through the executives, it led and bled into the streets where that still inspired the folks that were trying to do it the most. Because we all know if you were living in Hialeah, you were picking them up real quick to build an efficiency. You know, if you had a, a two-bedroom duplex, you were built, renting one out to pay for the, the other one. <laughs> Hey, but but think, yeah. think about this for a second, ready? You can have all the materials in the world, which Home Depot does. Yes. But if you don't have somebody to build it, to install it, to put it together, you're just going to have a bunch of materials at your house instead of sitting at Home Depot. Yeah. So that opportunity that he gave to those people, whether they were doing it the right way or the wrong way, they were doing it because of that. So, no, yeah. absolutely incredible opportunity that he did. And that, that's the thing with, with, with negative to positive where I want people to understand how Bernie grew up, how we grew up, how all of us have, let's say to society, a negative in, in our lives and our stories. But if you really look at America and what the American dream really embodies is a negative to positive. Sure. When you look at the Kennedys and they went from what they went through, which was bootlegging, okay, and then they became, you know, the president of the United States of America. OK, when you look at NASCAR, how it went from building stock cars that would take uh, liquor across state lines. That's how basically NASCAR was born, let's just say. And in Miami, clearly, we already know what the product was down here that created our economy, <laughs> which, well, you know, I, I don't have to, to say what it is, but no. those that know Miami know what it is. Just look at downtown. <laughs> yeah, look at downtown and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Get out of white buildings. <laughs> exactly. I, I promise you, there's no, there's no snowy mountains in Miami, but somehow there is. <laughs> Ironically, there is, right? But I, I'm glad that he came on. I'm glad we got a chance to have that conversation, and it just goes to show you that when you do right by people, when you do, when you do it from the heart, and you just don't do it for the paper, you don't do it for the money, for the bread, you help people, inspire people, motivate people, and you touch people in a way that you don't even know. Because I guarantee you, we could bring folks that go, Home Depot was my university for just sitting outside looking for that $50 for the day, $20 for the day, $100 for the day. And that to me, folks, negative to positive, but the true American dream. Amen, Amen. to that one. Yeah! Woo! <laughs>